Hi, everyone. It's Gracie with the Educator Wellness Revolution podcast. Hey, everyone. This is Scott Goldstein with Empower Ed and the Educator Wellness Revolution podcast. And we are so excited to have on today two DC educators to talk about the exciting new topic of flexible scheduling for schools, which has just generated a ton of interest and we know you all are eager to hear about. So I'm going to turn it over to them for some brief introductions. And if you wouldn't mind just start us off with just tell us your names, introduce yourselves a little bit, um, and tell us a little bit about your experience and interest with flexible scheduling for schools. I'll start with you, Ryan. Hi, everyone. My name is Ryan Reed, and I'm a middle school educator in Ward 8. I am a excited about talking about this topic of flexible scheduling because our school does use a flexible scheduling model, and I've been an educator for 11 years. Lucia? Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Lucia. I am a DCPS educator. I work at Bell High School and teach seniors this year. I started teaching during the pandemic. My first year teaching in the United States was 2020. So I've had a lot of variety of models of what a school day could look like. And I think flexible scheduling is the most exciting model by far. Um, and it's something that, you know, we're we're doing in every other profession. So I think teaching is it's time for us to catch up. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's something that you Scott, I hear you talk about a lot, which is like every other profession has gotten more flexible since the yes. pandemic and teaching has not been one of those. And um, I'm sure, you know, flexible scheduling, this conversation that people have been talking about and practicing in small ways um, for such a long time, but it, it just feels like it's reached the fever pitch recently, where it's like all we talk about when we talk about educator wellness. And so I'd, I'd like to hear from you why you think it is that that this is the topic. Um, Ryan, can we start with you? Mm hmm. Yeah, um, so there are so many different demands that educators have to uh, meet on a daily basis. And it seems like the demands just keep on getting more rigorous as time goes on. And one person cannot um, really handle that and be effective at the same time. So having a flexible scheduling model allows to build in more collaboration between educators and meeting the demands of our students. And then also, you know, the demands that we have as individuals and in supporting our families, whether that's doctor's appointments or just celebrating our kids by going to, you know, assemblies that they might have. Um, so a flexible scheduling model will be able to meet the needs of the whole educator and the whole student. Yeah, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. Also, I think as <clears throat> news stories comes out, things are in the media about teaching and teachers. I would say that especially as a young professional, the profession does not look attractive to new teachers and to newer teachers that are in the profession right now it seems like there are so many other options that they could do. They could be, you know, in marketing and work from home every single day and use their communication skills that they're growing as a teacher. And I think in order for teaching to remain a competitive profession that people continue to go into, you need to have those options that other professionals have because already we know that the salary is lower, even though Washington Teachers Union just helped us out a little bit with the salary bump, which I appreciate. But um, at, as somebody who could, could be working and could be making more money doing something else, you know, the love is really just what keeps you in the job, love for kids, the love for the intellectual demands, you know, it's nice to be up on your feet every day. It is a really rewarding job. And at this point now it, it isn't enough for a lot of people. So we need some kind of edge and flexible scheduling is definitely something that would tip that edge. Totally. I mean, I think anyone who's scrolling through their social media sees all these former teachers who now do some kind of PR or, you know, uh, dance for a living or something like that, right? Like, so th there's definitely that trend. And like you said, it's the love of teaching and the love of the work that keeps people coming back to it. But we just have to make it just enough easier, right, for people um, that who love it, who want to stay in it to, to feel like it's sustainable for them. Um, what's the typical pushback you hear on flexible scheduling uh, and what response do you have to it? If you've heard about, you know, kind of like maybe there's just some misunderstanding of what it is um, or some pushback around what it might look like for different groups. Uh, what what have you heard and how would you respond to it for either of you? Mm -hmm. I think because flexible scheduling is such a new innovation, people are just automatically, um, you know, hesitant because they're not really sure what it looks like. 
And the word flexible in itself means just that, um, that each school community is going to need something different to meet their individual needs. So it's sometimes difficult to say, okay, this is what flexible scheduling works like, looks like, and this is how it works, because there's not one answer, there's multiple answers. So um, if you are a person who is, you know, unsure about this, you just have to talk with your community, say, what are our needs and how can we create something that's going to be effective for everyone? And flexible scheduling is really about the equity needs of that community that you're speaking to and working with. So um, just be open to human design thinking to design something that makes sense for your community and not feel like you have to fit into a box of somebody else's ideas of what it is and what it's not. Yeah, I would 100% agree with the fact that people, it's new and a lot of new things in education are really hard to implement because education has been, you know, it's looked the same way. Like there's so many different models that you can use like project-based learning and all social emotional learning, even where not every school is implementing that and not every school feels comfortable implement, implementing that. So like Ryan said, it's it's a case-by-case -case basis of who can do what with what funding, with what time, with what hours. I think another pushback that I hear a lot is that one, that they're assuming that teachers, if they are given some flexibility, will work less, which I think is completely wrong. I think if if you give us a work from home day, like I'm using every single ounce of that day to get all of my grading to got done, get my lesson plans done. Like that would be so amazing to have one day to be able to work. I can actually do that and not teach. And also that school does fill a need for childcare during the day. And it's really difficult to manage different schedules. At one of my old schools, we had half day Wednesdays. So parents had to navigate what would happen at 1 p.m. when their kids would be out um, yeah. and, and where to put them. So that's another difficulty. But I think that they're in your flexible scheduling report, Scott, that there's so many different options for that. Yeah. Yeah. And th those are really important things to uplift because obviously parents are going to look at it and say, what does this mean for me? Right. In terms of the schedule for my kids, in terms of what kind of academics they're experiencing. But I think um, those are all things that the community needs to hear from their own parents and families about. Right. So that they make something that does work for the people in their community. But one of the things that's so exciting about flexible scheduling is the opportunity to enrich the experience that students have in school through things like project-based learning, experiential learning, outdoor learning, all kinds of things. So what, what excites you about the opportunities that exist for students? Mm -hmm. um, in the beginning of my introduction, I did mention that our school does have a flexible scheduling model. And it looks like on Mondays, we have an adapted schedule, not every week, but just on Mondays. And and the students are able to participate in different academies that we have in the building. So that's Elevate Academy, where the students work with representatives from UDC. We have a school garden. We have a hydroponic system. And then also that connects to the work that is happening at the high school, at Anacostia High School. So we're able to um, build stronger partnerships with the community because of this flexible scheduling day and having those extra staff come into the building to support. Then around um, 1.30, our students are able to go home or to you know support the family needs, or they're able to stay in the building and they participate in drama and photography, which they might not necessarily be able to do if we didn't have this flexible scheduling model at our school. So there's so many different um, you know, opportunities that our kids can now have because of this flexible scheduling model. Yeah, that excites me as well, just the opportunities from the communities. I feel like there are so many different ways that the kids from DC can be integrated or anywhere, but especially DC, we have so many opportunities with politics and that's our main you know, um, thing that we do here. And I think that when kids have that time and space to explore those different opportunities with different professionals, with groups coming in, you know, if they have, you know, if we have a Friday where the teachers work and the kids do all of their sports and then all, and then uh, people come in from local um, agencies and come talk to them about their work or have them intern with them. I think that's really beneficial for them. I also know that 
I'm, I teach seniors in high school. Some of them are primary caregivers for their families and they work. So they work, you know, the minute school is done from four till one in the morning and they're asleep for my class in English, not because it's boring, but because they're, you know, incredibly tired. So giving them some kind of flexibility in their schedule, especially on the older end of things, you know, high school and beyond, I think would be beneficial for the students as much as the um, people for work specifically. Mm -hmm. And just to add on to that, um, Lucia was talking about like teachers being put in a box to say that they wouldn't work. Um, I know teachers would just take off of work just to work, <laughs> just so they won't have interruptions from different people coming into the room so they can actually complete the paperwork, especially I remember uh, as a special educator, I, sometimes I would do that. It would be a sick day, but actually I'm working, completing uh, paperwork. So, you know, flexible scheduling models give opportunity for teachers to meet the demands. Yeah, I just want to add to that one thing, which is just like how valuable it is for students, right, that teachers actually do those things, right? The importance of, the, of actually having the time to connect with parents and families and update them on their progress or just giving quality feedback to students, which, you know, I taught high school at 150 students at a time. So the ability to give quality feedback to each of my 150 students is really limited without extra time to do that. And I think all of that is so important to name. And I also just want to put it out there that like just time for yourself is so important too. And time, like you're saying, Ryan, time to go support your child in school. And I think that's something that many parents with who are not educators, it's hard for them to understand that what they enjoy doing for their own kids, that the teachers don't get to do that. And, and I think it's looking at teaching as a lifelong profession. And in order to do that, you you need to have breaks and you need to have a life. And so just this flexible scheduling model, I think really does just build that runway to be able to do it for a long time too. And, and what I hear in a lot of what we're saying too is just, it's a lot of change. And I think it's a lot of change after we've already gone through so much change, a lot of it change we didn't wanna go through as a society and culture. And I notice when we talk about this with our partner schools, it's like we start talking about flexible scheduling and then we start talking about, you know, all the things that have to change about education and the conversation starts to feel really big. And that's why I love um, some of these models that, um, that Empower Ed has been discovering of like how it actually works. So I would, I'd like to hear from you, um, maybe we can start with you, Lucia, of what models have you seen work well or what models would you be really excited to, uh, to see what they would look like? Yeah, of course. I have seen um, half day models implemented in my school that I did I did think was positive, especially because this, the day itself was seen as almost like a break of a day. And it was more of a, the classes were shorter. There were only 50 minutes versus 70. And we treated those classes as like extra classes. So we would have our core classes be Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and then Wednesdays would be whatever supplemental thing we wanted to teach. So it'd be kind of like the, the fun day almost. And I think every classroom needs that. It needs that kind of, you know, break within the week because weeks are very long, especially 40 hour weeks. And when people are working remotely, I don't, I don't think they're working 40 hours. Maybe they're working more for some professions, but a lot of people, you know, might have a 20 hour week and, and then a 50 hour week and then a 20 hour week again. So I think being able to understand the needs of your classroom and having that like built in time where you can figure out, okay, do we need to teach more or do we need to teach less and just have fun here? And then also I'm really, really excited about tiered coming into work models where you come in, some people come in from seven to two, some people come in from nine to five, other people from 10 to seven or something like that. So there's always an adult in the school for kids. Cause as we know, kids, you know, some, some of my kids will stay at school until 8 PM um, just cause they either don't want to go home or need to do homework or what have you. But um, having a school fully staffed with adults during all those different times would be incredibly beneficial to the community. Mm -hmm. Ryan, any methods uh, or particular schedules? I know you have one at your school, but ones that excite you other than that? Um, I think just the idea that flexible scheduling is what, you know, is, is flexible um, gets me excited because you can actually change models too um, as the year goes on with different needs that arise. So, you know, just like we did with the pandemic, we switched to all virtual 
And, you know, it works for some families and some kids. Um, so if we could go back to meeting those families' needs, that would be amazing. Um, and I also, like, even at our school, so we started off the model where we would leave at 120, but during the day, the teachers would participate in town hall meetings with the kids. We would have high PE with the kids and all of the staff will be involved in that. And then we will go into professional development and collaborative planning time. We would um, have MTSS meetings on Mondays as well. So we switched really like how we use the time on Mondays. So the teachers are not as involved in the high PE and the town halls as they were on a frequent basis. And that allowed them to have more time for the MTS meetings, for the uh, collaborative planning meetings, for just getting together and, you know, grading papers together. So, you know, with that model, it gave the teachers more time to complete the work that they needed to get done. And we've seen, you know, different numbers that we've been trying to, you know, like we have flamboyant, where we talk about parent contacts. And that number has gone up because we've changed the model. So just being open to change, even yeah. if you think that you have a model that works. Yeah, and I love that because we we have to pilot these things and figure out what works for the community. Oh, first of all, we have to figure that out on the front end by trying to bring consensus, right, of all the stakeholders in the school community about what model is going to work for them, but also be willing to make changes as it goes. So let's talk about the money. So um, it's not free, right, to do it well. Um, so why does it matter for this to be funded by the city? Why does it matter for schools that they have some additional funding in order to do flexible scheduling well? Mm -hmm. Well, um, as I was saying, we do have the flexible scheduling model, but we don't have the funding to support it. So that's possibly why we had to make so many changes um, in time, because we didn't have, you know, the funding to say, oh, we need additional staff members during town hall meetings. So the teachers could not feel overwhelmed to be in this place and then going from the town hall to three meetings after that we could actually have staff during the town hall meetings and the teachers could stay working in collaborative planning at the same time that the students were also receiving the supports that they need. So um, human capital is definitely a space where we need funding. Yeah, I think it's such a such an odd thing that we are looking at this as like a school investment versus like a community investment or you know, these kids graduate from school and then they become workers in the community. There's there's no, you know, they don't exist as students forever. And their long-term investments, you know, they start at start start at zero and go up to 18 for us and then and then beyond. But you want to have qualified, happy, healthy workers um, and healthy people that are living in your community. And in order to do that, schools, which is the fundamental way that we grow and learn need funding. They need all, all of the funding that um, can help children grow and thrive, but also the people in the school. So when it comes to flexible scheduling, you're, you're keeping your teachers there. And teacher retention is a huge issue in DC. I think we're at like, what, like 20% every year we lose. And it's incredibly expensive for every school. Um, also, it's, it's a loss. So we've had this learning loss during the pandemic. And then it's exacerbated by the teaching profession got exponentially harder. Um, according to my colleagues that worked before and after the pandemic, I only know the hard <laughs> work. Um, and it and it is really difficult to get everything done. You know, the demands are higher, the kids are needier, and that's all to be expected. But it is, you know, something that is, I, I would say not to be alarmist, but it is an emergency. Um, we are seeing the ripple effects of kids testing lower, kids dropping out and graduating at lower rates, and teachers leaving the profession. So if, if we want to stop that, we need to invest in them now. Lucy, I love you talking about it being, this is like a community issue and not a school issue. And just one of the models that I get excited about in flexible scheduling are these camp days or and how do you bring more community partners in who run all these camps already and they often you know, are not able to be financially sustainable because they don't have the access to kids because they're in school when the teachers need a break. And it's like about being able to connect these dots and just all the people that are in communities that would have something really important to share, be it life skills, professional development, 
um, mentorship and that that, you know, there are programs that can make this work, but you need dedicated individuals who are doing the program management for this, who are scheduling this. And um, so I think it is uh, a lot about imagination um, of how to like put together resources right now. I would love to hear, um, let's make it really personal right now. I'd love to hear from both of you of just how having um, more flexibility in your job, how do you think that would impact you as a human being? How would that impact you in terms of your professional choices that you make going forward? Um, Lucy, let's go to you and then we'll, we'll end with Ryan. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, on a very personal level, I'm, I'm at the age where I would like to, you know, find a life partner, start a family and I can truly say that I cannot imagine, I know people do it. I cannot imagine having children and having this job at the same time. I just, it seems so unrealistic and so, so sad that I, I would have to choose between the two, but from the, just like the literal physical demands of your work day and the emotional demands, and then just having to, you know, think all day long, you know, it's a really difficult job and that's what I like about it. But if, if there's no kind of flexibility in my schedule or no breaks for me, um, I can't see myself showing up for any kids or partner that I have in my life. So, so I would really like to stay in teaching, but it's something that I do have to think about if the profession doesn't change in the next five years, what I'm going to do. So you might have another educator than leaving just for basic practical things of, you know, wanting to start a family, start a life. Thank you for sharing that. I will say, yeah, my story is honestly the same. Um, I wish that I had more time with my, I don't have any kids myself. And be, for that reason, I feel like I wouldn't be able to give them the love and attention that they deserve if I, you know, stay as a teacher. So I just don't have kids. Um, but I do have nieces and nephews. And honestly, a lot of the time that I spend with them is on video chat. And it's not even in person. Um, so that breaks my heart. And I wish that I had more time with my family. Yeah, and I can <laughs> testify to that as someone who left teaching I, exactly at the point of having my second child. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of people that are making that exact decision. And they're thinking about, like, can I start a family and stay in this job? And, you know, we do have a lot of educators, obviously, that that have children, right, and are staying in this job. And we heard so much in the survey that we did about flexible scheduling uh, of educators, both in DCPS and DC charter schools, um, that they felt constantly the need to choose between, you know, going to their kids um, you know, sporting event or performance or activity after school and doing the work they needed to do to serve their students. And it's just heartbreaking um, to hear that when there's there is a better way out there, because we we did have uh, I don't remember the exact percent, but a really high percent you know, of educators in our survey say um, I think it was, yes, uh, over 50 percent say they do have children. Right. Uh, and are still in the school system. But if you look at uh, our survey results, especially black women in particular and black women over 30 were the most likely to say I need flexible scheduling to stay in this job because um just you know if if you're trying to balance those things and feeling that increased stress so constantly it's just not sustainable um and I, there was one comment that just really stuck with me about the constant guilt of passing the stress on to their own children that they're bringing home every day and so it's not even just the logistics of like how do I do all these things but just the emotional toll of the stress you're bringing home from that job without flexibility and then all the things you're trying to balance in your personal life and in your family life. One of our other podcast uh, guests that we had, Chiara Monticelli, she was sharing that when she started at DCPS, she, she had, um, was, had her first child pretty soon after and she got a part-time schedule. And she kept that part-time schedule and now her second child is six and she's finally going back to a full-time schedule. And she really wants it and she's ready to do it, but she was able to stay in, in education because of that flexibility and raise her family. And now she has more to give to it. So I, I just like love that vision that people could, you know, take that time, be a little bit more flexible. And then when they have it, they want to go back in and, and they're not totally burned out at that point too. 
Yeah, and it's possible there are schools that do it. And I just love that possibility of thinking about how we target flexibility too. at like, you know, if you have new children, maybe you automatically, right, kind of have that right to increase flexibility for a period of time. Or if you're a veteran teacher, you're getting flexibility so you can mentor younger teachers. Or if you're a new teacher, you get some flexibility so that you can be mentored, right, and be supported in your first couple years teaching. So there's so much possibility for so many things we're trying to accomplish in education to to help teachers become more experienced and grow, to help people stay in the profession long-term, to help them communicate with parents, to help them give students better feedback. I mean, all of these things can be being made better by having more flexible scheduling. Anything else the two of you wanna add uh, onto that piece? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Scott, you were mentioning about how black women reported a higher need for flexible scheduling. And I recently was reading an article about how Black women in mental health, um, their depression looks differently for mm. Black women. It was a study done at NYU, and they were pretty much saying that Black women have self-hate um, it with on top of their depression. So it kind of makes it a little bit worse for us because we just have the world on our shoulders sometimes and we blame ourselves for lack of, you know, pr producing. So um Flexible scheduling for me would definitely take a lot of weight off my shoulders and be able to sustain and give to the community that I love. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, thank you for sharing that, Ryan. I mean, I, I I want every teacher that's in the profession right now to stay. I think that there's the people that have stayed this long and also the people that have left in the last couple of years, you know, it's a travesty for the people that have left um, for school districts and also for the people that are staying, you know, we're having to make these really hard choices about our lives. And it's really heartbreaking to see people that love kids, love the profession, love their subject, love their community and can't give them that love because we can't give ourselves that love back. Um, especially people of color that are already going through all the other things that they have to go through. And in, in addition to serving their community and like students that look just like them, like it's, it's critical that we have teachers that look like their students. And also I would say too, for lawmakers that if, if they're listening to this conversation now and they're hearing what we're saying, we're saying that we need to leave, you know, a, a critical part of the community in order to have a family. And so you either don't get, you know, educators or you don't get new community members you ha you have this choice but you could have both if you would invest in it yeah ryan um you said something earlier about human-centered design and i, I just want to as we close out here i want to come back to that point because this is you know i think so often in education it becomes about results and we want to push kids to be these adults who can achieve and and i think i think the pandemic has kind of helped a lot of us like redefine ambition of what are we actually ambitious for? And I and I think that humanity of like, if teachers are cared for, if they are happy whole individuals and they are modeling that and working with these kids every day, like I feel like that's the result we're really looking for rather than like everyone getting pushed to their edges and pushing the kids to their edges. And like, I think it's time to make that that shift. And so I, I really appreciate you sharing in the work that you're doing um, both in the classroom, but also in this advocacy, advocacy piece too. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. You go. You you have both been incredible advocates in this space, and I just want to share as we close out here that um, if you haven't seen our report at Empower Ed about the promise of flexible scheduling, you can find that online at www.we are empowered.org slash flexible scheduling. Um, and also to raise your voices in advocacy, whether here in DC or you're anywhere else in the country and you're in the teaching profession, if you're in education, to tell your lawmakers, to tell the people running your school district that this is something we need. Um, it's an innovation that not only requires coordination and collaboration at a school district level, but funding. Um, and as I've been saying to so many recently, um, this is going to happen because schools have to do this to retain their educators. It's just the way the workforce is changing, but it can be done well with funding or poorly without it. And um, so we need the funding uh, to make sure this is done well and that our students and our educators benefit from it. So raise your voices in advocacy, um, share your stories about how it would impact you. And just really, really wanna thank again, Ryan Reed, Lucy Applequest for being two amazing advocates for this and for sharing your voices with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Gracie. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.